Good afternoon. I'm Angela Stewart. I am your host for the History Matters podcast, a feature of Women for Progress Radio. Women for Progress Radio was created by Mrs. Willie Jones, who serves as Women for Progress president and the executive producer of Women for Progress Radio is Mrs. Juanita Brown. I am Angela Stewart, your monthly host for our History Matters podcast, where we discuss history's importance and why history matters, why history matters. And there have been some important things, and this Happy New Year. Let me go back and start with that. Happy New Year to everyone. We are in a brand new year, 2024. And we are just so ex- excited about starting a new year and getting everything off the ground and running. So let me know in the comments if you make New Year's resolutions. And if you have, and you have any that you would like to share, share them with us in the comments. But this is January 18th, 2024. January is a month named for a Roman god known as Janus. And that god had a head, actually a head that faced forward and backward, meaning January is a time of year to look both forward to the future, but evaluate what we did in the past. So that's what we always do in the month of January. Uh, But today, we are going to be talking about several topics. Um, One of the first topics I want to talk about is something that started as a hot topic last fall, last October, and came to a head early this year, and that was the resignation of Claudine Gay as the first African-American female to serve as president of Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So let's look back at the history of Harvard, um, in particular, a the first African-American to receive a PhD for, from Harvard was William Edward Burkhardt Du Bois. William Du Bois was a native of Massachusetts. He was from Great Barrington, Massachusetts. He received his bachelor's degree from Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee, a master's and a PhD from Yale University and would do further study at the University of Berlin in Berlin, Germany. I always like to say that W.E.B. Du Bois had for his time period, he was born in 1868 and died in 1963. He died during the March on Washington in Accra, Ghana. But I always like to say he had education from three of the best institutions in the country, in the United States at that time when he was going to school. And he would go on to become a pioneering historian, sociologist, economist, one of the founders of the NAACP, he would found the NAACP's official organ, the Crisis Magazine, which is still in production today. But I wanna start with a quote he had. But what of black women? I most sincerely doubt if any other race of women could have brought its finest up through such devilish a fire. And that's from W.E.B. Du Bois' essay, Damnation of Women. Um, But we learn from history um, because history doesn't stay behind us. It helps us to understand why events that happen in the past are important today. With lessons from the past, we learn about ourselves and how we came to be. We learn to avoid mistakes and create better paths for our societies. And we really need that today. So like I said, um, William Du Bois received his um, 
PhD from Harvard in 1895. So a year before the Plessy versus Ferguson decision, which said separate but equal was, was constitutional, W.E.B. Du Bois would receive a PhD in history from Harvard University. Um, he would also go on to study, as I mentioned, at the University of Berlin. And he would come back and he would teach at um, HBCU, such as Wilberforce University and Atlanta University in Atlanta, Georgia. While teaching at Wilberforce in Wilberforce, Ohio, he met his first wife, Nina Gomer. They would get married and have two children, and they would be together until her untimely death. And then his second wife would be Shirley Graham Du Bois. His PhD dissertation was on the suppression of the African slave trade to the United States, 1638 to 1870, which was published in 1896 as the first volume of the Harvard Historical Studies series. So that's the past, that's the history of um, a brief part of the history of Black people at Harvard University. That's not the only history of Black people at Harvard University, of course. But we, we want to look at now is current history of Black people at Harvard University and how it is reflective of the broader um, circumstances that are going on in higher education in 2024. Um, Claudine Gray resigned Tuesday afternoon, January 2nd, 2024, as president of Harvard University after fierce criticism regarding the university's response to the Hamas attack on Israel and backlash from her disastrous congressional testimony. And it even began, and when that didn't seem to be enough, it would go on to include allegations of plagiarisms and doubts about her academic integrity. She was only president of Harvard University for six months and two days, and that is the shortest tenure in Harvard's history. Harvard University Provost Alan M. Garber, who's a 1976 graduate of Harvard, will lead as interim president until a new president can be chosen. Uh, she chose to re resign effective immediately after persistent, deliberate, calculated criticisms and pressures. Um, but there has been a varied response to her resignation. You know, Black women in Washington state are standing with Dr. Claudine Gay after her resignation as Harvard's first Black woman president. On Martin Luther King Day, just this past Monday, they delivered a letter in an act of solidarity um, with Claudine Gray. Lanisha the Bartolayam, Laban, um, who I know from Noah from the Association of African American Museums where she has served as board president. She recalled the importance of this moment. She said, Dr. Gay's resignation is disheartening and prompts a call to action among black women. We recognize that we need to galvanize and collectively support one another, she stated. Black women in leadership often lack needed support from their internal organizations, which make the journey of leadership tedious and fraught with stumbling blocks. This letter was signed by hundreds of women ranging from state representatives to senators to NAACP members. So, and they recognized that there were several things that led to her resignation racism, sexism, covert bullying, 
and other marginalized and demeaning practices led to Dr. Claudine Gray becoming the shortest term Harvard University president. But her resignation and what led to it is systematic of a larger problem and a larger attack that has been raged against what is called DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. And governors such as Ron DeSantis, state leaders and think tank members have come together and corporate leaders have come together to fight against what they consider reverse racism or racism against white people, diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, um, you go all the way back to the Baki decision, which outlawed affirmative action, some forms of affirmative action in medical school enrollment programs, or the most recent um, striking down of affirmative action programs um, that use race as a method of determining whether or not students can be enrolled in schools. And there are leadership groups and individuals who are steadfastly opposed to using race in any form as a remedy for past segregation, racism, or any other inequities. So th these individuals saw the Hamas attack on Israel and the reaction of university presidents such as Claudine Gray and such as the now former president of the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, as an opportunity to attack not only these individuals at these institutions, um, but to attack broader programming. You know, there has always been a reaction to any kind of restorative justice or equity programming in the United States for over 300 years, people of African descent were enslaved in the United States. That slavery formally ended with the passage of the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution in 1865 after the end of the United States Civil War. For a brief period of time, the United States Congress passed civil rights acts and programs such as the Freedmen's Bureau to help correct wrongs that have been done. I mean, now these wrongs have been done for over 300 years, but they were only allowed to function for, in some cases, less than 20 years before the United States Supreme Court and state legislatures attacked and dismantled these programs. So we had what was called the first, what people call the first reconstruction, which lasted approximately from 1865 to 1877 in a formal federal sense. Now that doesn't mean that um, African American men stopped being elected to an office immediately in 1877. I live in the state of Mississippi and people such as John Roy Lynch served in the United States Congress until the early 1880s. But what the Mississippi state legislature and leaders recognized when they developed what became known as the Mississippi plan, which included a new state constitution um, in 1890 and several laws included in that constitution that restricted voting without using terminology that referenced race. 
So what the 1890 Mississippi Constitution allowed for is, for example, grandfather clauses, which basically stated that in order for, and, these, and we're talking about men voting for, for the most part, because women in the United States, for most of the United States, didn't get the right to vote until the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920. So we're talking about men. The suffrage or the franchise in the United States started out when the United States was first organized as a country as a very limited thing. It was designed for rich white men with property so that individuals had to be number one, rich, number two, male, and they had to own property. During the time of Andrew Jackson as president of the United States, there became a push to broaden the franchise for white men so that men who didn't own significant amount of property could also vote. So you had an expansion of the franchise for white men. In 1870, the franchise was expanded to include all men, but in particular, African-American men, men who had formerly been enslaved. So these were kinds of the equity um, measures that the United States Congress was using between 1865 and, as I mentioned, the early 1880s. The United States Supreme Court in a series of decisions started knocking down these laws. They um, did away with the Freedmen's Bureau um, and other activities that helped formerly, particularly formerly enslaved individuals after the Civil War to build lives so that by the half century in 1950, 15, African Americans celebrated 50 years of freedom, 50 years of freedom. And by 1915, most African Americans in Mississippi couldn't vote. They couldn't attend integrated schools. They couldn't drink from white water fountains. These were all the kinds of things that were going on um, in 1915 at the 50 year point. So we're talking just 50 years since the end of slavery. We are in a system of what was called Jim Crow segregation that in the American South, was legally mandated. Other areas of the country had segregation, but it was what they called de facto segregation. It was more by custom and by geography than by law. But in the United States South, it was by law. And, and why am I going through all of this, what seems right now in 2024, uh, distant history. It's because it isn't. Um, governors such as Ron DeSantis in Florida, Gregory Abbott in Texas, and other leaders are chipping away at programs such as diversity, equity, and inclusion programs to get to what they say is an American society, particularly in higher education, that's not race-based. That, you know, so for example, most diversity, equity, and inclusion programs only impact a small number of individuals, but they don't even want those individuals. And I, I want to share with you something that the people who led 
the campaign to get um, Claude, Dr. Claudine Gray out of office as president of Harvard University did. First of all, they considered what they're doing uh, as being their attacks on woke, you know. Uh, what conservatism, in my opinion, does best is it learns how to define what should be positive things as negative. So being, quote, woke is a negative thing. They have made liberal such a bad word that even a lot of liberals are hesitant about being described as either liberal or progressive. But what they are doing is they, as much as it is in their power, especially at state institutions, they are eliminating diversity, equity, and inclusion programs in those offices. They are doing away with even being able to talk about racism, sexism, you know, there are some states that are even looking at, you know, making these, excluding these from the idea of, of you know, talking against racism and sexism, excluding that from free speech. Um, so this is what we have going on. And now there are corporations who are getting in it, into it too. Elon Musk, who brought what formerly was known as Twitter and now is known as X, is one of the leading bashers of DEI and programs such as DEI in the United States. Um, because, and it's not just a racial thing, it's about LGBT rights, it's about women's rights, it's about anything that they feel attacks the life and livelihood of people who look like them. Um, and so that to the point where even places that are wanting to do DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts are being a lot less vocal and mute in their activities because they don't want to get caught up in the um, confusion and the that is going on. Um, Christopher Ruffo on X said, we expose corruption at Harvard and work to restore truth rather than racialist ideology as the guiding principle of American academic life. You know, there, you know, when a few years ago, when Nicole Hannah-Jones and others started putting out things such as the 1619 Project and people talking about the impact on race on American history, there was a backlash because there's a certain group of people who don't want to believe that race has any place in discussion of American history or that their history is universal history. So whatever history, generally great white man history should be universal history and the only history taught. You know, Ron DeSantis attacked AP courses, the idea of offering AP African-American studies courses as dangerous forms of indoctrination and things like that. Um, but what these people have that works for them and what people who disagree with these ideologies have to work against are well executed and well-financed plans. Because I mentioned Elon Musk, who's a billionaire. 
And there are other billionaires who feel the same way he does and are willing to put money behind their feelings. Um, you know, and they argue that, oh, no, they're not being racist. Um, you know, here again, Ruffo said his campaign against gay was not fueled by racial animus. It was fueled by Claudine Gay's minimization of anti-Semitism, her serial plagiarism, her, her intimidation of the free press, and her botched attempts to cover it all up. It had nothing to do with her race or sex and everything to do with her merit, her competence, and her failure to lead. So this is what they argue. They say, oh, no, we are not being racist. We're not being sexist. We are looking at merit. But who is going to define what merit is and what merit means? You know, um, before the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, between 1890 and 1964, Registrars in Mississippi could hand African American potential voters portions of the Mississippi Constitution of 1890 and ask them to not only be able to read it, but also interpret it. And they they were the ultimate and only judge, the registrar was the ultimate and only judge of whether or not the African American interpreted correctly. And the framers of the 1890 Constitution said they went out of their way to write a constitution that would not be easily interpreted by anyone so that they could disqualify Black people from voting without having to use the word Black or Negro to, without having to include race. Um, so, and that's what these, that's what these people are doing. They say, we're not, we're not racist. We're not even using the word race. We're not even concerned about race. We're concerned about competence. We're concerned about merit. And, you know, on the surface, all of those sound like, okay, well, and good. Everybody ought to want people, especially as the head of a multi-billion dollar university to be competent. But the question becomes, how do we determine who's competent? Who says who's competent? So, and they've even gone on now um, to, and they're, ult and they're very upfront and transparent about what their goals are. They, Ruffo said, my primary objective is to eliminate the DEI, the diversity, equity, inclusion, bureaucracy in every institution in America and to restore truth rather than racialist ideology as the guiding principle of America. Now, if there is no more subjective term in American history than truth, no more subjective term. I mentioned earlier reconstruction for a long time, there were there was what was called the Dunning School of Reconstruction. And the Dunning School of Reconstruction said, you know, life in the South pre-1860 was perfect. Slaves were happy, economies were flourishing. Then you have this war from 1861 to 1865, which destroys all that. And you get these people who have no business being in office, running the South from 1865 to 1877. And then you have these people who come back after them and let's call them redeemers you know that's i'm from mississippi that's what i learned in mississippi history life before the civil war perfect life during the civil war hell life immediately after the civil war 
was just an extension of that hell because of the federal government interfering in the return to normal for people who had been in power before the Civil War. And then you had these people called redeemers who returned the South to what it had been before the Civil War. This is, so um, there's a saying, well, a lyric from a song that says, everything old is new again. What we see going on with um, the attack on diversity, equity, and inclusion is an example of that idea that everything old is new again. And what I found interesting, conservatives had the opportunity to finally demonstrate an effective countermeasure against the long walk through institutions. And these people looked at their successes as being upturning Disney, Bud Light, and Harvard. They say, we have established the playbook. Now it's about execution. This is what we're looking at. This is what is going to be determining what kind of world uh, our children and grandchildren and great grandchildren live in. Because in the United States, it's not just Congress that makes, you know, we learned in, I'm old enough to remember Schoolhouse Rock, and you learned in Schoolhouse Rock that there are three ban branches of government, and you learned about how a bill becomes law. But that's not the only thing that impacts. American culture. The United States Supreme Court impacts American culture. Today, social media, um, think tanks, um, organizations that directly influence legislative bodies by even providing them with legislation that all they have to do is fill in the blanks. Quasi-politicians and demagogues, these are the people who determine, if we aren't careful, what world our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren are going to live in. So the resignations of people like Dr. Claudine Gray and the president at the University of Pennsylvania, the people who were successful in getting them out of office, they acknowledged that this is just the tip of the iceberg. This is just the beginning, it's not the end. They are constructing a carefully arranged overturn of American life and culture. And something to remember, you know, the threat of liberalism is actually very small in the United States. The United States has been what we would call today a liberal country for a very small period of time. You could say from the time President Harry S. Truman desegregated the United States Armed Forces in 1948 till the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980. 1980. That was the limit of, quote, liberalism in the United States. Now, that's not to say that groups such as LGBT groups haven't been making steady progress between 1980 and 2024. Yes, they have, but in terms of the nature of people's thinking, what people think the country should be about, 
for a vast majority of people. It's not liberalism, it's not LGBT rights, it's not diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, they talk about, you know, Donald Trump's um, slogan is let America be great, making America great again. Great again. When was this greatness that he's specifically talking about? That's what we have to understand and look at so that it's not just um, and making sure that when we elect politicians, they understand all of these things and all of, and they're able to deal with the pressures because it's a lot of pressure that is put on politicians, both by other politicians and people outside politics. These are all things, and you're like, wow, what does all this have to do with Claudine Gray getting um, resigning this? It is everything to do with it because it's not just one thing. It's the start of something. And we have to understand it as the start if, if whether we agree with it or whether we disagree, we have to understand where we are to know where we're going. So what do we as Americans want for the United States, for our communities, for our children, for our children's children? These are all kinds of things that we have to start thinking about now and into the future. So that's our, that's our first big topic, Claudine Gray um, and Dr. Claudine Gray and her resignation. You know, she served, she didn't even get to serve a year as the first African-American woman president of Harvard University. Um, and the impact of it on education, you know, um, back when the first attacks against critical race theory started, a lot of people go, ah, oh, that's nothing. It, it won't have any impact because critical race theory is just something taught at law, in law schools. That's the only place where people have access to, quote, critical race theory. But people have used attacks on critical race theory to trickle all the way down to things such as the resignation of Claudine Gray, the attack on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we have to also think critically about these things and not just say, oh, well, that's, that's no big deal. And look at the reasoning behind what people are doing what they're doing, you know. There is an emotionalism on the surface that can be either attractive or repelling, but what we have to do is get beneath the emotionalism and move to what is this and what impact is it gonna have on my community? So that's, our first topic. Our second topic is about an author, uh, Octavia Butler. Um, Hulu briefly ran a one season show based on one of her earliest books, Kindred, which is a wonderful book that I recommend to everybody. She's considered an Afrofuturist writer. But I want, in this kind of leads in from what we just talked about. I want to share this quotation from Octavia Butler. She stated, choose your leaders with wisdom and forethought. To be led by a coward is to be controlled by all that the coward fears. To be led by a fool is to be led by the opportunists, opportunists who control the fool. To be led by a thief 
is to offer up your most precious treasures to be stolen. To be led by a liar is to ask to be told lies. To be led by a tyrant is to sell yourself and those you love into slavery. And this is a quotation from her book, Parable of the Talents uh, by Octavia E. Butler. I find it interesting that she wrote two books, A Parable of the Sower and T Parable of the Talents, which have biblical parallels in the gospels. These were two of Jesus's most famous parables. She is considered one of the founders of the artistic movement known as Afrofuturism. This movement imagines black people surviving into the future to shape cultures that did not yet exist. This politically and psychologically meaningful cultural vein explores black resilience and regeneration beyond slavery and racism. It does so while not denying their brutal legacy. So Afrofuturism is something that's very pertinent to our time periods right now. She was a person who didn't just think forward, but she was also able to think back. When I started today, I talked about the Roman god Janus, where we get the word January from, who had the ability to look forward and to look back. That was the kind of thinker Octavia Butler was as well. And she recognized that key feature, future, features of the future lay just outside of view of the past. So um, here again, this is what we are talking about with History Matters. There are things in the future that you can find out about and understand better and work against a four by understanding the past. She called this histofuturist, histofuturist approach. She predicted that America could slide into autocracy, a decline quickened and deepened by environmental degradation and technological advancement. Now, that, that's almost some noxious Damas level prediction because she's right on the money with that. That because of technology and changes in our environment, you know, I live in Jackson, Mississippi, and in Jackson, we don't get, a, generally speaking, a long winter. We are not Minnesota or any place like that, you know. I have a sister who lived for 10 years in this Minnesota and I growing up had a neighbor who moved to Mississippi from Detroit and was always, always marveled at how little cold weather it took to throw us off kilter. But we've had weather in the teens this week and it has wreaked havoc on our water system, which, which a lot of people have already heard about issues in Jackson water uh, so these are the environmental degradation, examples of environmental degradation that Octavia Butler was talking about. But technological advancement, you know, people are able to spend a lot of times, you know, one of the refrains on message boards oftentimes is that people need to go outside and touch grass, meaning they spend too much time on YouTube, on Facebook, on Instagram, on X, um, um, just any kinds of technology that it allows them to get disconnected from reality and humanity. And this is what she's talking about, the impact. And it, and it leads to a sense of disillusionment and uncertainty that make autocratic leaders attractive because they seem to have all the answers. 
In her books, Octavia Butler saw the tendency toward enforcing hierarchy through abuses of power as the root weakness of human character. Any change generates inequality, she wrote. She predicted that a change in climate patterns affecting Earth's livability would inevitably foment social conflict and exploitation. And here again, I said, we see that going on now. Um, but for her, environmental injustice was not only the case that environmental risk and hazards would fall disproportionately on communities already marginalized by geographical location, lesser power, and stigmatizing identity markers such as race. It was also true, Octavia Butler reasoned, that climate change would further inequality as human beings did what human beings always do, compete over who's got the biggest or the best or the most. This was an old entrenched tendency, which meant that it was historical. And here again, like I said, I live in Jackson, Mississippi, and oftentimes our most basic needs, such as clean water, are impacted by a legislature and a governor who are openly hostile to an urban majority Black city, even though that city is the capital of the state of Mississippi. Our governor has often stated, you know, the best time for him is any time he's not in Jackson. And, and as governor, his residence is in Jackson and his office is in Jackson, but he would rather be anywhere but Jackson. And our neighbors who have been a part of our water system are using our problems with the water system to justify getting out and getting their own, you know, the mayor of a small town um, south of Jackson um, has said that, you know, Jackson water's problems are what are keeping them from being able to get more businesses to their community. But I would argue that that's not the only reason why businesses are not coming to this community. <laughs> but that is an excuse that people would readily jump on and agree with because they already have negative views of Jackson based on water issues. Um, so this is what she's talking about here, that we, how environmental and environmental environmental change will change not only our communities, but change our politics and our people. And I mentioned politics. So the last thing I want to talk about, and that was from T.E. Miles wrote a wonderful article on Octavia E. Butler for Atlantic Monthly. Um, it's on the uh, theatlantic.com website. Um, and I would highly recommend anybody who's interested in Octavia Butler, Afrofuturism, environmental justice, I would recommend you check out that article. And that's T T I Y I Miles. And her article is How Octavia Butler Told the Future. And like I said, it's from The Atlantic, the, the Atlantic.com. T H E A T L A N T I C.com. Uh, I started out talking about W.E.B. Du Bois and W.D.E.B. Du Bois was a frequent contributor to the Atlantic Monthly magazine. Um, but I want to close out um, this week's History Matters by talking about three biopics. One has already aired, has already available now, what these three biopics have in common, one, 
they're all available on or will be available on streaming sites. They're not things that you have to go to the movie theater uh, to see. If you have Netflix or Hulu or Disney, you can see all of these. But they are three movies about Black people. Two of the movies are about Black people. Most people either don't know anything about or they know a little bit about. And then the, the other one is about two people that Black leaders that people think they know everything about. You can't really tell it, but the picture behind me is of Martin Luther King, Andrew Young, um, and his other leaders helping African-American children integrate the Grenada, Mississippi public schools. And since this past Monday was one of these incidences where both Martin Luther King's actual born day, his birthday is January 15th, and the Martin Luther King federal holiday actually fell on this past Monday, the 15th. So they actually coincided this year. But the first movie I want to talk about is already out. You can, you can watch it now on Netflix. It's Rustin. And it's about Bayard Rustin, who was an Af he was African American, he was a pacifist, and he was gay. And he was very proud of all three. He was a complicated individual. He had some attitudes that some people might find um, disturbing or confusing. Um, he was opposed to affirmative action and he had other issues. He um, debated uh, Malcolm X and he was opposed to most of everything Malcolm X was doing. Um, but he was a activist and organizer. Um, former President Barack Obama considered him one of his inspirations for getting into community organizing. Bayard, Bayard Rustin was from Pennsylvania. He grew up a Quaker, raised by his grandparents, and Quakers are known for their anti-war. The um, ideology, so he grew up with pacifism and anti-war ideology. He um, would go on to counsel Dr. Martin Luther King during the Montgomery bus boycott. He worked extensively with A. Philip Randolph, who was the leader of the, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. He worked, he was a primary organizer for the 1963 March on Washington and Rustin the movie starring Coleman Domingo is largely about his work organizing the 1963 Civil Rights March. But it is also about how the civil rights organizations interacted during that time period about what it meant to be a gay black man in 1960s America during the movement. So, and it stars an out and proud gay black man in Coleman Domingo, who's also getting recognized this year for his work in The Color Purple, where he plays Mr. He takes over the Danny Glover role. But what I love about his portrayal, it re, and it's the same thing I loved about Eric Todd Dullums played um, Bayard Rustin in Boycott, which is, a, as the title implies, is about the Montgomery bus boycott, and, it, and that is available streaming on Max. Is that 
their affinity and pride as gay men shine through their ability to play a gay and out gay man. So you get to see the complexity of individuals. Now, nobody's perfect. Nobody's one dimensional. Nobody's a saint. And you see that throughout the movie, Rustin. <coughs> Excuse me. The other two movies are coming out this year. On February 1st, in their Genius series, this year, National Geographic is focusing on two individuals, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. There's a famous image of one of the few times Martin Luther King and Malcolm X actually met in person and shook hands. And it kind of jumps off from that image and looks at the life and work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X and the similarities and contrast. And that would be available beginning February 1st on National Geographic. And it will stream the next day on Disney Plus and Hulu with two new episodes debuting weekly on all platforms. And then the final movie is Shirley, which is Netflix and is set to debut on March 22nd of this year. So during Women's History Month, and it's about that trail political trailblazer Shirley Chisholm who pride herself on being a catalyst for change, the first black woman to seek a major party's nomination for president. In 1968, she became the first black woman elected to the United States Congress. It is written, by, written and directed by John Ridley. Shirley tells Chisholm's inspirational story and stars Regina King as Shirley, Shirley Chisholm. So these give you three different African-American leaders. And I love that, you know, one came out this past year in connection with the March on Washington. One is coming out February 1st, but the other one is also coming out in March. So you get a a span of time, you know, it's not just a dump in February of Black history. Um, and it's important because these are people we don't get a lot of information about. You know, Shirley Chisholm was an important leader as a woman, um, not only to the state of New York and the city of Brooklyn, but to the United States. This program, History Matters, is part of Women for Progress. And my mother, Mrs. Dorothy Stewart Samuel, founded Women for Progress. And one of her key ideas she got from Shirley Chisholm, that idea of being a catalyst for change. So even in this organization that is providing the content you're seeing now, we have been directly and indirectly influenced by the work of a Shirley, Shirley Chisholm being catalysts for change in our communities and using platforms like this. The History Matters podcast is a part of the Women for Progress radio network. We are found on most podcast platforms. We're live every third Thursday of the month from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. And we welcome you to come and join us and to share with us your impressions and questions and comments and reactions to what we talk about on the History Matters podcast. And to, but we really want you to remember that history matters. 
not just for yourself, but for your family, your community, our country, and for the world. History matters. And I thank you again. I am Angela Stewart, your host for History Matters podcast of Women for Progress Radio. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing you next month.